Hi, welcome to the video version of the Towards Data Science blog, Measuring Statistical Dispersion with a Gini Coefficient. My name is Kimberly Fessel. I'm a senior data scientist instructor as well as the author of this blog. Before diving into what the Gini Coefficient is, first consider three different scenarios. 100 people that have $100 each, 50 people that have $150 and 50 people that have $50, or one person with $10,000 and 99 people with nothing. Certainly each of these three scenarios is different, but if we were just taking the mean value, we would come up with the same $100 per person for all three situations. Here the big difference is how money is spread out among the people, or statistical dispersion. Statistical dispersion just refers to how values are spread out among your data, and you probably already know that standard deviation could be used to measure this. I want to introduce you to another way to measure statistical dispersion, namely the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient was introduced about 100 years ago by Corrado Gini, and its original purpose was to understand income or wealth distributions, in fact, the United Nations continues to use the Gini coefficient in order to understand wealth inequities among various different nations. The purpose of this blog will be to introduce you to how the Gini coefficient is defined, but as well as to show you a couple of different interesting, uh, unique use cases for the Gini coefficient. So it doesn't have to be contained just in economics. We can actually use this for other situations as well. Before diving into the Gini coefficient, I need to introduce you to something called the Lorenz curve. To trace out the Lorenz curve, you basically want to do two things. First, sort your data from smallest to largest, and then you're going to plot out a line that represents the cumulative percentage of value seen so far. So basically, if we're traveling along that purple line that represents a hypothetical Lorenz curve, um, each of those values corresponds to the cumulative percentage of observations we've seen so far versus the cumulative share of values we've seen so far. So as a hypothetical example, if we're studying wealth and we found that the poorest 30% of our population contained 10% of our wealth, that Lorenz curve should pass through the point 0 0.3 and 0 0.1. One other thing to notice about this curve is the uh, line of perfect equality. So basically, if all of our data points are exactly the same, if everybody has $100, we would be traveling along that line of perfect equality for the entire data set. The Gini coefficient basically measures how much our data deviates from perfect equality. So the way that you can calculate Gini coefficient is to take the area that's shaded there in purple and divide it by the area A plus B. So as you see, as the Lorenz curve pulls away from the line of perfect equality, the GD value will get larger and larger. If we are starting on that line of perfect equality, we'll have a Z value of zero. If we eventually reach perfect inequity, the GD value should be very close to one. So in those original three examples that I showed you, the situation where everybody has $100 each will give us a Gini value of zero. But the situation where one person has $10,000 and 99 people have nothing will give us a value that is very close to one. In Python, if you want to compute the Gini coefficient, you certainly could do this with numerical quadrature. Numerical quadrature would basically just allow you to do numerical integration of those areas, and you can do that with SciPy. But another way that people typically do this with Python is to use a different um, definition of the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is also defined as half of the relative mean absolute difference. So here we're just computing the absolute difference of all the different pairs in our data set, and then summing all of that up and dividing by more sums. You actually don't have to compute all of these pairs as long as all of your data points are positive. So I found a really nice implementation of the Gini coefficient that's even speedier than this, um, written by Olivia Guest. So if you want to check her out, she's on GitHub. And this is going to be the implementation of the Gini coefficient that I'll use in the following use cases.
So let's first talk about baby names. The data I'll be studying in this section comes from the Social Security Administration. And basically we have the frequency of first names given to babies for each year by gender and by state. I'll be looking at data from 1950 onward. So when I looked at this data, I first just tallied up um, all the most popular names by gender. And I found out that 18 out of the 20 most popular names since 1950 all refer to male babies. This had me wondering, you know, where are the female babies? Well, if you look across the entire data set, it is true that there are fewer males, uh, excuse me, there are fewer females than males, but there are far more names given to female babies in the data set. So this is tracing over time from 1950 onward and tallying up the total number of unique names given to each gender. And we find that there are just more names given to females every single year than males. So I wanted to also study this by Gini coefficient. If we tally up um, all the different names and all of the different babies that were given each of those names, plot those from the smallest frequencies to the largest, we'd find that the Gini value for female names is really, really close to one, it's 0.96, and for males it's even larger, 0.97. This basically just means there are some names that are ultra popular, given to millions of babies over this time period, whereas there are other names that are very um, unique and only given to about five babies in the whole time period. So this difference between females and males doesn't look that large yet, but we can also do this for every single year. So here I'm taking each year of the data, tallying up the total number of babies given each name by gender, and just tracking that across time. We'll see that the Gini coefficient for males is consistently higher than females every single year. This just means that there is a higher amount of statistical dispersion in the male names. There are a few male names that are very, very popular and continue to be popular throughout time. And um, that just means that females are kind of spread out among the different names more than males. And I suspect this is kind of having to do with uh, naming trends. For example, if a name is passed down generation after generation, that might result in uh, kind of these ultra popular names that are found for male babies. One other interesting thing we see here is that basically since about 1990, the Gini coefficient has been tracking downward, and that really just represents um, people's tendency to lean more toward unique names for babies rather than to follow um, convention and continue with the same sort of popular names each year. We can also use the Gini coefficient to understand popularity of specific names. So here I've plotted Scarlett and Miriam, both of these names represent about 60,000 female babies uh, throughout the entire time period, but you'll see that they have very, very different popularity patterns. Miriam has been given to about 1,000 babies every single year since 1950. So, uh, and meanwhile, Scarlet is completely different. It only really took off in popularity around the year 2000. So if I start taking each year and sorting those by the least popular year to the most popular year for each name, I can trace out the Lorenz curve and comp compute the Gini value for each of these names. Scarlet scores at 0.8, which is very large, meaning that there were some years that Scarlet was super popular and some years when it just wasn't that popular. Whereas Miriam is pretty close to zero, meaning it's had consistent popularity throughout the entire time period. So now let's pivot away from baby names and start talking about healthcare prices. These data come from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the data basically represent um, just procedural averages for individual U.S. hospitals from the year 2017. And so, by the way, these are all procedures uh, and data that pertain to um, people who um, are covered under Medicare services. So this is a relational database, and uh, one column in this data set contains the procedure or diagnosis related group. And basically this is just what kind of procedure that this person have. We also have the name of the hospital and then we'll have the average hospital charges for that procedure for that hospital. So how much on average does this hospital charge 
And then we also have how much on average does this hospital actually receive in terms of payments. And those payments could be um, out-of-pocket costs, but are primarily uh, Medicare payments. So I wanted to understand this data set a little better with the Gini coefficient. I'm basically going to try to see, are there any procedures that have really different values as far as charges and payments um, among the different hospitals? So are there any procedures that really could use a little bit more standard standardization uh, in terms of what individual hospitals charge for them? So I took a look at those hospital charges, and now I'm going to do a Gini coefficient for each procedure um, in the charges. And what I found um, was that the procedures that have really high Gini coefficients, and that would indicate that different ch hospitals charge very different amounts, those kind of procedures actually are typically procedures that kind of vary in severity or vary in duration. So the very top procedure here, alcohol and drug abuse um, with rehabilitation therapy, is a type of procedure that really could you know, vary in terms of length of treatment or the severity of the treatment. Um, so it's not that surprising that that uh, procedure tops the lists. And also other procedures here with really high Gini coefficients like the coagulation disorders or psychoses are other procedures that just vary a lot in terms of um, illness severity. Procedures that have really low Gini coefficients, and that would mean that various different hospitals charge pretty similar amounts. Um, we're really talking about now procedures that are pretty standard. They're, they're mostly heart procedures, and most of these are kind of one-time events. So for example, angina pectoris is just chest pain. So uh, someone just being admitted for chest pain uh, and then being released. It's a pretty standard sort of one-time event. So you can kind of understand why we're seeing really similar charges among all the different hospitals for these. So I wanted to take this a little bit further. Um, is it such that some of those uh, procedures with really high Gini coefficients need more standardization? Well, um, instead of now looking at just the hospital charges, let's also look at the actual payments received by those hospitals. So these are typically going to be payments that Medicare is actually providing for that service. If I take a look again, now the Gini coefficients for all the different procedures, but for payments received, those Gini coefficients are lower for every single procedure than what the hospital actually charges. So what that indicates is that Medicare already has uh, you know, contracts in place to kind of standardize the payments that it will pay for a given procedure, no matter which hospital you're at. So that was really interesting to see that we've actually already developed quite a bit of standardization in that we have lower Gini coefficients for each procedure. You know, no matter which hospital you go to, Medicare is going to pay a similar amount. So I just wanted to end kind of on a couple of, uh, of notes here. The Gini coefficient um, could definitely be compared to standard deviation. They're both measuring uh, statistical dispersion, but they do it in really different ways. So the first really big difference is that the Gini coefficient um, is unitless. So um, the standard deviation is actually going to retain the scale of your data. If I'm studying dollar amounts, then standard deviation is also reported in dollar amounts. Gini coefficient, on the other hand, is typically ranging between 0 and 1 and is just a numeric unitless value. Gini coefficient is also bounded. It typically ranges between 0 and 1, whereas standard deviation could be boundless. It could be any positive value all the way up to infinity. And lastly, the big difference is kind of how they judge dispersion. For Gini coefficient to obtain that largest value of 1, you would basically need one data point with all of the values and the rest zeros. But for standard deviation, if you want to uh, attain the maximum standard deviation, half of your data points will live at the minimum and half of your data points will live at the maximum. So they're really judging deviation in kind of two different ways. And so depending on your use case, you might consider all three of these different differences before choosing between Gini coefficient and standard deviation. There are definitely limitations to the Gini coefficient, and the first one is really just true of any summary statistic. Gini coefficient condenses information. That's its job. So we lose the granularity of the original data set because we are condensing information down to just one numerical value.
But that also means that Gini coefficient is many to one. There are many different distributions that can map to the exact same Gini coefficient value. Gini coefficient is unfortunately sensitive to outliers. If we have one additional very, very large or very small value, uh, that can really result in dramatically different Gini coefficients. And in terms of economy, um, Gini coefficient has also been kind of criticized because it's maybe not sensitive enough to changes in, in a population's poorest or wealthiest communities. And so um, economists have actually introduced this other metric for judging statistical dispersion called the Palma ratio. And it specifically is looking at um, the poorest 40% of a population and the wealthiest 10% of a population. So if you've enjoyed this blog, um, you can check out the code that powers the, all of the analyses as well as the figures that I've shown you on my GitHub page. Here you'll see the various code to be able to apply that Gini uh, calculation from Olivia Guest. Uh, and you'll also see all the code that um, powers each of those uh, matplotlib figures. This was Measuring Statistical Dispersion with the Gini Coefficient, and I'm Kimberly Fessel, and I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in.